Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the SEAI National Energy Research and Policy Conference 2023. I'm Margie McCarthy, Director of Research and Policy Insights with SEAI, and delighted to welcome you here this morning. We have a great gathering of attendees today spanning from across all interest areas, from energy research to policymakers and to interested citizens. Um, and I hope you enjoy and engage with the lineup of experts and discussions we've got ahead of us today on the theme of achieving sustainable energy security. So I'll invite you to settle in as our CEO at SEI, William Walsh, opens the conference. On behalf of the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, welcome to our 2023 National Energy Research and Policy Conference. This is an important annual event that brings together people from energy research, policy, industry and community groups to learn from each other and connect with research. Today should be an opportunity to discuss how research can support our people, homes, businesses and government to deliver Ireland's energy revolution. This conference series was launched in 2019 and over the years we've concentrated on different important topics such as transforming Ireland's electricity sector, the heat sector and also the transport sector. We also delved into social acceptance and public engagement that underpins these transformations. Today's conference is focused on the theme of achieving sustainable energy security and we've a really expert and interesting lineup for the day. Since 2022, energy security has been a topic of conversation for most of us, whether that's at the kitchen table or in the boardroom. The war in Ukraine had a considerable impact on energy prices in Ireland, impacting everyone's cost of living. As a small, advanced island economy and society, it brought energy to the front of all of our minds. We will reflect on this today and what role research holds in supporting evidence-informed policy decisions on security. This is broader too than Ireland. Global energy security depends on collective support of sustainable energy security for developing countries. Over the last five years, SEAI has supported approximately 200 innovative energy research projects with almost 20 million in funding awarded in our most recent annual research call. This research, awarded through a highly competitive best practice review process, is filling gaps in knowledge and addressing challenges that need to be overcome in our energy transition. Part of our role is to ensure we connect these outputs from funded research with citizens, businesses, policymakers, as well as into our SEAI programs to create discussions and opportunities for knowledge sharing. Collaboration is central to SEAI. Our climate action challenge is too big for any one actor to succeed alone. We actively seek to work with all those in Irish society, listening to ideas and building relationships, helping to support individuals, communities and businesses in Ireland to be part of the sustainable energy revolution. I would like to thank all contributors today and all who are attending. Thanks for the part that you play in climate action. I hope you enjoy and engage with today. And thanks to William, who's very sorry he couldn't be here today. He's traveling overseas with urgent work. Um, so our, our journey today will kick off this morning with uh, two panel discussions uh, connecting research and policy, where we're going to look at the question of sustainable energy security from a global context and then reflect on what is happening in Ireland. And so we're going to discuss what questions and gaps in knowledge and data exist that research and policy can work together to fill. So that's going to be looking at current research outputs relevant to energy security. And then we're going to close this afternoon with a very interesting, exciting conversation about the future perspective. So what's next? What do we need to do or consider or test or overcome to ensure we achieve sustainable energy security for our future? So we'll have plenty of breaks in there and we'll keep a close eye on time for you between the next sessions. Um, but it's my pleasure to, to introduce the first two panel discussions and to set the scene for our first panel, I'd like to introduce Dr. Morgan Bazilian. So Morgan is director of the Payne Institute and professor of public policy at the Colorado School of Mines. He's no stranger to Ireland, having worked with SEI in the past and, and been an advisor to the Irish government. But he's been a lead energy specialist at the World Bank and has over two decades 
of experience in energy, natural, natural resources and environmental policy. So Morgan is joining us from the wee hours in Colorado. So we really appreciate him taking part today. And he's going to speak to us on a global perspective on sustainable energy security. So I'll hand over to you, Morgan. you uh, in what is the middle of the night in Colorado, and uh, I wouldn't miss it. So I'm going to um, give a few uh, slides to help help me go through uh, what is now decades of research on energy security. Um, let's... Now, of course. Great. Um, so again, thanks very much for having me here to SEAI. And um, that was a, a very useful opening by the, the, the CEO. Um, energy security is top of mind uh, in, in, in Europe, of course, um, most recently because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's worth noting that um, the, the prices that are impacting on European Union member states and most countries uh, in Asia as well, uh, started to rise fairly rapidly before the invasion. Um, some people have credited uh, Putin uh, with uh, the fact that the invasion coincided with uh, um, the, the most pain for consumers in Europe and Asia. The United States did not feel that in the same way. And so the, the while this was, the, we're still going through one of the largest global energy crises uh, that, that we've ever seen, um, some countries, namely the United States, have been largely immune from uh, some of the price rises, and, and that has implications for geopolitics. In, in 2008, I co-wrote a book with the catchy title, Analytical Methods for Energy Diversity and Security. It, uh, because of that title and the content, which is largely mathematic, uh, was not a bestseller. Nevertheless, it's worth going back to, I think, um, I published that book while I was living in, in Ireland, and in it, in the first paragraph or second paragraph, we note the acute risk of Russian gas supply. So the, uh, Russia, of course, has invaded Ukraine previously, and there were, in over 2008 and 2009, uh, several issues of transit through Ukraine. So it was not a surprise uh, to anyone, especially those in the European Union, um, that this could happen. Nevertheless, uh, the, the policies and the investments uh, were not put in place with, uh, to deal with mitigating this risk, especially of natural gas from Russia. It, it's worth considering in the book that we noted that there are very different market types in energy and those require different approaches to risk and they understand different time frames and different pricing mechanisms specifically here markets for oil which are global are different than what are regional markets uh, for natural gas uh, becoming more global with the trade of lng which we'll get into um, but they're very different than how electricity markets operate and how the players and the stakeholders and policymakers in those two or three different kinds of markets um, look at risk. And so it's important to take them separately. Um, typically, people immediately come out and say, well, let's look at things like energy efficiency and structural change. Um, that has happened, of course, in the European Union. Um, there has been uh, uh, energy demand levels that have uh, dipped dramatically because of actions in the European Union. Still, whether they're structural or not uh, remains a question. And that has large implications for, 
for economics and for industry. Um, interconnection, so tying a system with other systems, as, as Ireland has done over the last decade or two, uh, can help. Um, but it depends on what's happening with your partner countries, uh, wh whether how much it can help. And of course, it takes an enormous amount of time to get these things uh, done. Um, likewise, diversity of supply, which is typically the focus, in other words, moving from one fuel that is risky to another that is less risky. Um, also, it takes a lot of time and money. And uh, and we need to think across supply chains. These were all lessons that we put in a book 15 years ago. So they're not new lessons, but they're very difficult to uh, implement, as, as we can see from the response so far. In 2007, so the year before that book was published, we put out something called the Security of Supply in Ireland with SEAI's old name and old logo, um, which I still quite like. Um, and in it, the Security of Supply in Ireland was queried through about, I can't recall, but it, at least 30, so three zero different metrics. And those ranged from oil import to the functioning of NORA to gas markets to electricity markets. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that there's not one, but many metrics. And that's energy, people, uh, many people on this uh, call or this meeting think through an energy lens. And that can be limiting because energy, of course, is interwoven through society and economies and specifically on security with food security, water security. And in the United States, we talk a lot about national security, which I can get into. Um, the the challenges of, of, of the LNG market um, are, are very salient for today's energy security crisis, especially um, in Europe and for the United States, but for very different reasons. So right before the invasion of Ukraine, six, six or eight months before, uh, the French government blocked a shipment of US LNG uh, because it was too dirty. And that's my understanding of the French translation. Um, what too dirty meant was not entirely clear. Something about methane emissions likely, um, as well as flaring, as well as politics. Because what we saw then was uh, about a year later, a year and a half later, um, a, a dramatic uptick in in um, contracts for LNG. So the 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 deal that was stopped was seven billion dollar deal. Uh, you can bet that the finance houses in New York and Houston and London and Dublin uh, were very concerned about that. Uh, the year and a half later, we now have at least three. I think probably closer to five or six deals worth at least that much. Uh, the molecules themselves did not change at all. There are new ways to look at security globally. And my group uses satellite uh, imagery to look at everything from power systems to uh, illegal fishing to flaring. And most recently in the middle on the right, you can see a daily map that we provide to Ukrainian forces that shows both the state of the power system and the kinetic activity, as we call it here, which means the bombing. Um, in the lower right is an image of Syria over the course of the terrible conflict there, and the, the lights going out, the power system. Uh, and in the upper left is the United States with the lights, of course, but also you can see in the middle of the country there in Texas and North Dakota, the flaring from the gas, uh, flaring from associated gas and oil fields. Uh, onto things of closer to national security, like illegal oil production in Iraq and Syria, or the lights going out at the Bagram Air Force Base as the United States forces pull out. One area that's gotten a lot more attention uh, in the past, say, three to five years in, in the United States, is a political uh, one of the only areas of bipartisan political agreement, it's also uh, uh, high on the agenda in Europe, is the area of critical minerals and how they come into society that is moving to clean energy technologies. They come with it their own set of security concerns. Um, one way we started to think about security 
from a research perspective um, is something we've termed actorless threats. So we, we, we looked at that during COVID and termed both the COVID pandemic itself and climate change under this category of actorless threats. Actorless in this case means from a military perspective, there's no one place or one set of people or one area to, 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 to bomb or to, to place military um, uh, activity on, but rather that that has to be treated as a national security perspective on, on a much wider and diverse and diffuse set of actors. Um, on the international theme, years ago, we looked at how uh, it, fragile and conflict states would plan power systems or energy systems under conflict and came up with a new mathematical way to address these very difficult concerns in, in those kind of states. We can get into that later if you would like. The US military looked at our work uh, in Afghanistan as an example. This is my final slide. It's important to keep in mind that what we're aiming for here is security and not independence. There is a political attractiveness, especially in the United States, but I believe in, in most countries around thinking about how to shore up our own borders, whether that's physical or, or um, metaphorical. And it's the wrong framing to make good decisions. The better decision is about how to uh, increase security and increase, in this case, sustainable security. Um, and that means not just diversification of supply chains, but diversification of demand, looking at how resilient systems are, looking at the institutional landscape, the market landscape, and looking across geographies and temporal aspects across time. Margie, I'm going to stop there and thank you very much for uh, having me at your important conference. Apologies, everyone. Classic uh, mute mistake right at the outset. But thank you, Morgan. And looking forward to chatting to you more later. Indeed, on actual threats uh, is something that we certainly will talk to. And, and just even the visuals that you're able to show there around measurement and, and the information that can provide to us on energy security. Um, but Morgan will join us uh, after we hear from our next speaker uh, for our panel discussion. Uh, but next up is Dr. Claire DuPont. Uh, Claire has provided a recorded piece for this session because she'll be joining us live for the closing panel discussion this afternoon. Really felt the points that she was making were really pertinent to the conversation we're going to have. So she's going to speak to us um, on the considerations for governments working to ensure energy security while meeting energy targets. Um, Claire, Claire is an associate research professor at Ghent University and carries out research on the politics, policy and governance of the transformation to climate neutrality and sustainability. Um, so I'll hand over to Claire. Thank you. I would like to thank the organisers at the SEAI for inviting me to participate in this conference. The theme Achieving Sustainable Energy Security is a key building block of the transformation that needs to happen in the coming years, in Ireland, in Europe and globally. I'm really delighted to be able to contribute to the discussion at this conference. And I will focus on the wider politics, policy and governance aspects of this theme, also placing the challenges faced in Ireland into the European Union context. But first, I want to begin by reminding us of the climate challenge and by zooming out to visualize the wider issue. The changes in global temperature caused by human activity are unprecedented in our human civilization. For the last years, we have been seeing and feeling the impacts of the climate emergency across the world. In Ireland, there have been more extreme storms and record temperatures. In Belgium, we have suffered floods, drought and heat waves. This summer, large swathes of Europe were on fire. And this is just the beginning. 
This is also coupled with unprecedented crises, COVID-19, the energy crisis, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that have laid bare the vulnerabilities of our current energy systems and the inequalities in our economies and societies. With the reminder of the climate challenge at the forefront of our minds, we should understand now that transformation is inevitable. Business as usual is no longer possible. That inevitable transformation can be a chaotic climate disaster, unmitigated climate change with drastic impacts, or it can be a managed transformation to a more sustainable future with efforts to mitigate climate change to limit the impacts and efforts to adapt our economy and society and to regenerate our planet's coping capacity. I think we can agree that the second managed and governed transformation is the more desirable. The energy sector is one of the key pillars of the governed transformation efforts. Energy has been a key focus point of much climate-related policy for the past 30 years. Since the early 1990s, in the EU and its member states, efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions have emphasised the importance of increasing the share of renewable energy and improving energy efficiency as part of a larger set of climate-related policy measures. And we have seen the success of some of the EU's strategies in the general downward trends in the production of greenhouse gas emissions in Europe. On this slide, you can see that the EU has successfully reduced its production of greenhouse gas emissions between 1990 and 2022. The energy transition is happening in Europe. Indeed, given recent crisis, the energy transition may now even be accelerating. The slide also shows that we are not yet on track for the future. Extra policy and implementation efforts are required to meet both the GHG emission reduction goals of 2030 and several policies were adopted in Europe this year to help close this gap, and also the goal of achieving climate neutrality by 2050. Placing the Irish context into this evolution, we should then be aware of two points. First, Ireland has hardly followed the majority of its EU partners in steady greenhouse gas emission reductions. But second, there was a rebound in emissions across the EU after COVID-19. Ireland is certainly not alone, or special here. COVID-19 showed us that we shouldn't overestimate the impact of individual behaviour change on greenhouse gas emissions when our systems are unchanged. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine and energy crisis have shown us that we shouldn't underestimate the impact of individual behaviour change, even within our current systems. This is not yet fully reflected in the graph on the slide, but European citizens, organisations and businesses have massively reduced their consumption of energy, particularly with regard to heating. But while the political context in the EU has included the energy sector in the climate transition context, energy security has often been treated as a different political beast. It is important to understand the evolution of what is meant by energy security. In a theoretical context, on this slide, energy security implies a balance ac across three energy policy objectives. Energy security, meaning the ability to meet demand. Energy equity, meaning the ability to ensure energy is affordable. And environmental sustainability, meaning an energy sector that avoids environmental and climate harm. This three-pronged energy policy approach has previously been a source of political challenges. Not all aspects have been viewed as complementary and coherent, and different political actors have placed greater emphasis on one goal over another. The most equitable energy used to be viewed as fossil fuels, cheap and affordable. The most environmentally friendly energy sources were previously viewed as expensive and unreliable. And the most secure energy sources were often the least environmentally friendly and sometimes not the most affordable. In 2023, given the crises we have passed through and the climate context, we can no longer treat the three objectives separately. Energy security, energy equity and energy sustainability are coherent objectives with renewables and energy efficiency as the key pillars to achieve all goals. This is finally being reflected in the politics of energy security at European level and inside EU member states. 
In other words, ensuring sustainable energy security is now accepted to mean increasing production of sustainable energy and reducing energy consumption overall. With the European Green Deal adopted in 2019, there is now a momentum towards the coherent and holistic understanding of transitioning to climate neutrality, with the energy transition as a key pillar of that. How we get to that goal is still up for debate, whether that means relying on technology and ignoring the social aspects, whether it means emphasising the social and participative aspects and risking slowing down the transformational process, whether this is a policy mandated transformation or whether it relies on private business and individual investments or efforts, or whether this is a massive public investment and society wide effort. Many of these ideas are about the order of political priority we assign to our societal goals. The European Green Deal provides hints that our priorities may be changing. While politics and governance in Europe has long been about ensuring economic growth as the peak objective, we may now rather be seeing the emergence of a different order, placing our life-supporting planetary systems at the heart of a societal ambition implies a regenerative approach. This has implications for how all aspects of our society and economy function, and it is a vision that also helps to ensure the coherence of the energy trilemma is highlighted and not the political and policy interpretations of specific aspects that have previously enhanced the contradictions in the past. In any case, transformation is inevitable. As part of that, the energy transition is happening there is still time to shape and govern and manage that transition as a technological fix or as a society-wide evolution towards sustainability. But to develop, understand and implement the holistic transformative vision and to agree on the shape, scope and speed of the transformation, the political context within which policy decisions are made is particularly important. I hope I've been able to contribute some ideas to your discussion throughout today's conference. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Claire. Um, as I mentioned, she'll join us again for the afternoon session, uh, which will be another interesting discussion. But now we, Morgan will join me back on screen for our panel discussion. And I've also the great pleasure of welcoming Minister for Transport and Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications, Eamon Ryan, to the discussion. Um, hello, Mr. Ryan, welcome. Um, uh, you need no introduction, uh, I'm sure, to this, this audience in particular, but he has been Minister for Climate for some of the most groundbreaking aspects of climate policy and legislation in recent times, embedding climate action in Irish law, including, for example, our rollout of carbon budgets and sectoral ceilings. Um, so delighted to have you join um, and great to have you back, Morgan, to talk further on your points earlier. Um, and just to pass on, I think people would have expected Amanda Wilson from Natural Resources Canada to be enjoying the, uh, joining the discussion. Unfortunately, Amanda had to pull out very last minute. So anyway, transformation is inevitable, as Claire just said. Um, to start off, I, I thought I'd just recap on the IEA definition of energy security is the uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. Uh, so I might ask you both, maybe go to you first, Minister. Um, we've seen there in the last two uh, speakers the evolution of energy security. So what does energy security mean today in your view and, and how should we be measuring it? Good morning, Margie, and good morning, everyone. More than anything else, good night, Morgan Bazilian. I, I, I don't know what time it is in Colorado, but um, it's a weird flashback for me to hear Morgan talk about energy security. I was minister in 2007 and eight when he wrote those books he mentioned earlier, and, and uh, um, it's great to see Morgan and, and looking forward to seeing him in Paris, I think, in a few weeks' time at an IEA event on rare earth minerals and security. And, and I'm attending that event because I have the great honour this year of being the co-chair of the International Energy Agency as we go into our 50th anniversary. And that question, what, how do you define energy security, is, is very much central to our, our purpose and our thinking as we celebrate the anniversary. We have a ministerial meeting on the, uh, in February next year where, where we really focus on that. 
And if I was to answer your question to somebody, you know, how do we define energy security? Maybe to look to an IEA lens. 50 years ago, I think it would have been, you know, how many barrels of oil can we store to get to stop the price of the dollar a barrel going up above a certain level? Or it was like the counterpoint to OPEC. I don't think that is the key metric for energy security at this day. We, I mean, yes, we need, obviously, oil and gas security for the transition period. But I think our, I think our definition of security would be more aligned well, well, you see it, what, what FATI and the IEA have been saying in recent weeks and months about the tripling of renewable power and the doubling of efficiency being the key metric that was stitched into the G20 statement last week and that we're looking to get into the COP28 statement. And um, and I think that is, that's the priority. It is it's now the ubiquitous, uh, just... Uh, fair market access, universal access to those renewable and efficiency technologies is going to be the greatest protection of security. And sorry if that's a long answer to your first question, Margie, but, but I think it's important. And I think yeah. because, because we're seeing a, a remarkable change. I mean, again, I'm kind of, I was cringing slightly when I was listening to Morgan because I remember back in 2007, I would have been one of the key peak oil people or would have been very close to Colin Campbell and others Kind of saying, you know, oil peak out at 90 million barrels a day, and and we're facing a downward curve from there. And, and of course, what happened to shale oil came along, fract, fract oil and tight oil, and America went from five million barrels a day to 10, 12 million barrels a day producer, and other discoveries in Africa and elsewhere meant we got up over 100 billion barrels. So you have to be careful in terms of what what's happening. But but what's happening today, I mean, what they're again quoting the IEA, because I think they're good on the data here, that analysis, Fatih had an article in the Financial Times yesterday saying we are looking at peak oil now, not from a supply side, but from a demand side, demand reduction due to EVs and due to heat pumps and so on. Well, heat pumps less so in oil, but, but, uh, but I think that's why I think the focus on renewables and energy efficiency technology, it is... But it, it gives us the opportunity to, to bring the demand curve down and that to give us the security and price stability we want. I, I don't think price stability would be that easy because it's going to be a turbulent downward trajectory full of bumps like this. And it's more than a bump we've seen with the Ukraine war. Yeah. I don't think it, it can be managed completely that risk. But the, it's it's renewables efficiency as the cornerstones of the, of the revolution that's happening, uh, and that making sure everyone has access to those is the greatest security. Thanks, Mr. Yeah. Thanks, um, Morgan. If I can ask you to reflect on it, uh, looking at that overview you mentioned in your book, thirty metrics. So uh, back in the energy security report with SEI at the time. Um, taking into consideration all of the changing sands with energy security. What's your view on that now in terms of those 30 metrics and what's the right thing to measure? And and also with those great visuals you were showing during your speaking point, where can research and data really help inform those metrics? Thanks, Margie. Well, first I would say that uh, Ireland is uh, very lucky to have uh, Minister Ryan there who's I think one of the best or the best uh, in the business uh, in that role and understands the very dimensions of energy security better than most. So, uh, you know, I think it's it, it's very difficult to come with a strict definition of energy security. It, it mostly relates, like other government work, to priorities. And if so the priorities of, of different countries um, belie what kind of actions you're going to take and, and, and what form energy security looks at. You know, I now live in the United States and yes, it's uh, early in the morning here. It's a very militarized country and we have an enormous um, a military and defense budget and, and a political focus on security from a what's called here a national security perspective, which in large part means a military and, and intelligence type of uh, priority. And from that perspective, um, 
energy security can still mean things like how much stuff can we stockpile? How do we get things we need? How do we protect um, supply chains from threats, from military threats? Um, and so that, and, you know, it, energy security in the United States was sort of defined in the 1970s under the Carter, under when Jimmy Carter was president under something called the Carter Doctrine. And since that time, we've had the what's called the Fifth Fleet of the U.S. Navy protecting the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, that is protecting the, the shipping lanes for oil coming out from, from the Gulf. Now, the United States is now the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. Is it still valid for us to put billions of dollars into uh, military efforts to protect the Strait of Hormuz, or should we be protecting the Strait of Malacca, or should we be protecting the the the, the Gulf in, in the south and southeast part of the United States as, as this transition moves? So the transition is multifaceted. And when we see the environment and the trade and the shipping and all those things change, even that sort of hard energy security, the, the, that military piece needs to change as well, likely. Um, of course, and I think it's very useful to say what the, to emphasize what the minister said about other parts of the world in, in developing economies, especially in very poor countries, um, the term and the priorities are very different. And, and they look at economic well-being and economic development above all else. So when, when you have a different priority, your um, your actions are very different, as I started saying. And so we see uh, countries in the global south um, with very different concerns around energy security. And in fact, over the course of the war in, in Ukraine, um, the concerns of developing countries have act on the energy security side have mostly been about price. And they've been even more acute around food security. And so their priorities have shifted in a different way. Uh, in Europe, you saw, you still are witnessing very high prices across energy chains that has implications for, excuse me, for society and for industry. Um, in the United States, we, we didn't see those. And so the priorities and the actions on energy security were very different. Um, and so the political priority in the United States actually, oddly enough, is, is largely around the price of petrol for cars. Even though that, that does not have a real constraint on it, it's the political priority. And there's been a rash of policies over the course of COVID and um, more recently during the energy crisis on those. So I, I guess, Margie, we... The reason in 2007, when we put together the energy security metrics report, we had to look at 34 or 43 or whatever the number was, different metrics was because of all these different uh, multifaceted priorities coming up. And that's just in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I think I'll stop there yeah. by, by just highlighting one thing uh, i'm going to get to see the minister and, and at the international energy agency as he alluded to in a couple of weeks on on this mineral what's called critical minerals or, or mineral security um all of that is playing out right now from a geopolitical from a security from an economic from a supply chain perspective uh, in critical minerals as the demand rises and so in energy security just like in mineral security, you have to think about how markets are telling us what these things are priced and are those prices valid and transparent and have good governance and what kind of institutions are helping us um, think about these things, manage this risk, and especially uh, how we deal with demand, which uh, the minister, of course, uh, is excellent on. Thanks, Morgan. And actually, we'll come back to the I suppose, changing geopolitical relationships in a moment. Um, Minister, I wanted to go to you first, though, on the developing economies piece. Um, you know, you've been involved and even in the last COP was over uh, as well on 
um, helping to support in loss and damage and adaptation. Um, what, in your view, does, for example, energy security in Africa mean and how does it relate to energy security as we understand it in Ireland? And how, how will ensuring others are fossil free first in their kind of clean energy transition also ensure our security? What's your view on that? Good. I'm glad you asked the question because we're in the middle of this, thinking about this and working on this. And it, this is going to be very big geopolitical broad and people will excuse me, maybe going quite broad in the, in the perspective. But I think our security in Ireland, in Europe, is in, in, inexorably tied to the security of our neighbours in Africa. And, uh, and I just want to set out some of the stepping stones that we need to take in, in, the, in this direction. Um, Mia Motley was a good, is a good place to start, the, the President, the Prime Minister of Barbados, where she said in COP in Glasgow last year, in Sharm el Sheikh last year, that there was a fundamental injustice that the access to the new clean energy technologies that provide both security and prosperity are, are completely skewed. Um, the, the countries in the developing emerging con countries are paying an interest something like 14, 15 percent. That was a year ago, it's gone up since. And the developed world, something like three or four percent, uh, and that in, uh, inability to access finance is crippling the ability of countries to get access to the technologies. Um, there have been various initiatives since President Macron held an important summit in Paris on this issue, and I was happy to be glad to be in, Af in Nairobi last week, where uh, the President of Kenya hosted a major African conf African Union con conference on the same issue, and I think. There, there's really, it's really important that we deliver on this access to finance for loss and damage, for adaptation and mitigation, because it is a global problem and our security won't be enhanced unless our neighbours is, as I said, not just in terms of the context of global climate, and, and the, but also because of the food and water insecurity that's, that's connected to this. You know, migration is, is obviously one of the most important issues for Europe uh, and similarly for the states, migration from the South, South America, you could look at it in that light too. And the stability there, uh, you know, more, uh, I'd say Britain, Europe has a choice now in terms of our investment. Do we go the hard kind of border approach or do we try and solve some of the stability issues in, in the Sahel, in North Africa and in Horn of Africa, West Africa? And, and I think it's obvious that the latter is the better approach. And I think also, if I can as well, how that enhances our security. And this is slightly abstract, but again, I, 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 the president of Kenya has been doing a very good job, in my mind, on the politics of this, in, in the way it's presented. He's seeing it as an opportunity, uh, as a opportunity for development. And there's an, a real connection now between development and, and climate and energy policy. Um, and I think there was a simple thing he said in Paris that struck me as true, that we need global solutions to global problems. And just as in oil security, security by having a fungible global market, as Morgan says, and actually you're starting to see that happen quite quickly in gas, you know, the, the switch to LNG is creating a more fungible international market. Well, similarly, I think we need a fungible market, not just in finance, but also in supply chains for renewables and efficiency technologies, PV panels, EVs, heat pumps, all the cornerstone, more energy efficient technologies. And, and that'll range from the 600 million people in Africa who have no access to energy, who have to get that as a first principle, first basic right, to the development of an AC grids in those countries and interconnected and even to a longer term a super grid where you're shipping power over HVDC networks. And I think the advantage for Europe is... I and mean, I was listening to President von der Leyen's State of the Union speech yesterday, and one of the critical things we need to avoid here, in my mind, is a trade war with China on the clean energy technologies, or with the US, you know, Europe, China, and America, the three big kind of develop, developed economy blocks. Well, China is in a strange place in that regard, but, but if we go down to a protectionist division on this, it won't serve the energy transition, it won't provide energy security. In some ways, in my mind, that the the development the access in the developing countries and then the diversity of supply with involving developing countries, you know, country, critical countries will be the likes of Congo, Central African Republic, those areas where a lot of the rare earth minerals are, are are, are going to be key to this security transition. And again, rather than go back to what Morgan said, a military approach to try and protect supply chains. 
the having a diverse location for the processing and deployment of those critical rare earth minerals and, and the other uh, technologies that come with it. It helps, first of all, Africa develop and meet their energy transition needs, but also it avoids us getting into just a trade war with China, which is one, another real risk in terms of you know, America, China, that could really trip us up. So I think I'm going to Washington on Monday, I'm meeting Secretary of State Granholm, Secretary of State Energy. That's the message I'll be giving. And the last thing, sorry for the long answer, part of this global solution to global problems, we need global funding to help make this happen, not just in lower interest rates, not just in IMF and World Bank balance sheets being expand, expanded and special drawing rights being changed and all that sort of technical financial stuff. I think we need fun access to financial resources. We need global tax on aviation. Even 1% would give us 8 billion a year, which would do a lot to protect against the loss and damage that's happening. And similarly, in my mind, the fossil fuel industry is paying a similar sort of 1% levy that would need to go towards investment in energy, uh, clean energy technologies in the developing world, um, th that would actually, that kind of having access to the capital, managing the currency risk, those kind of real, those, those difficult finance issues, can't just be a government aid, um, you know, because every government comes to budget is worried about their own health, education, other budgets. Where you have some global financial supply or, or, or um, solutions that gives you some of the core seed capital we need to make this transition, I think it'll help it on the justice side, the politics. You know, it won't be easy politically to do this, either in China or America. I think Europe may be as slight as we heard there in the previous conversation. I think Europe maybe slightly ahead on this because uh, it realizes that for Europe, which doesn't have the uh, the fossil resources, the speed and, and the breadth of this transition will help us. So that's, sorry for a long answer, but no, actually, yeah, I, I, allowing developing countries have access and develop the technologies increases our security in a whole variety of different ways. And I think that is has been the focus and the message from the IEA. And I think I'm very glad we, we've, we're putting that at the central message. In, in, and the fact that Kenya and Senegal have just joined as associate members of the IA is a further signal of that intent and direction. Um, thanks, Minister. I might stay with you there for a minute then uh, in terms of the geopolitical relationships as you've talked through. Morgan referenced them quite a bit in his speaking point. I mean, in terms of... Recognizing the part that research will play in that, how do you feel Ireland is placed in terms of we, our reliance on low carbon technologies and the minerals and resources that support those to come into effect is, is quite big as it is globally. Do you see enough research and information and data to support Ireland in the route forward for us? Um, or what gaps do you think are missing? Well, I'm, I'm speaking to the current head of research for SEAI and the former head of research for SEAI. So You're going to throw it back to crazy, me. <laughs> and the, and the, the answer will correct you, be we need to spend more on research. Uh, and I think that is true. I, I always remember going back to Morgan previous, Morgan when he had his office outside my office in the ministry, had the second law of thermodynamics up on the wall with all its complex glory. And if someone couldn't, uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't adjust or show that they were within that, laws of physics then that they were thrown out of the building uh, and I was um, I think actually we're in a good place I think because we have developed a lot of variable wind power um, onshore we are one of the economies that's got the cutting edge as to how you the, the key of this transition it will it will be electric it will be renewable it will be efficiency and therefore the balancing capability between variable supply and variable demand which is the center of the new industrial revolution we have an advantage of, from a learning by doing uh, reality where AirGrid and ESB and, and SEAI and others have been tested in terms of how do you do that? How do you do that and maintain a stable grid and so on? So I think we have a real opportunity and real advantage. There are others catching up. I mean, we've had a slight pause in the role of renewables because of a slowdown in the planning system. But once that's overcome, which it will be now, uh, we'll see more onshore wind, we're seeing a huge increase in solar, and we will see offshore coming in at scale. So that balancing trick, which is, I think, the centre of the research side, uh, we're going to be right up there in terms of learning lessons 
uh, as to how you do this. And ultimately, go back to what I was saying earlier on about the economics of this, like it does have to work, like it, it, the transition can only be work really well when it's towards a better system, more efficient system, meeting the laws of physics. That, And I think what we're seeing is the technologies like heat pumps, like EV batteries, they are more efficiency. They're, they're, there's an efficiency gain that, that uh, that means you can do it. But but what you need then is a different market system, a different grid system, different um, demand really, flexible demand being the key side of this equation. And I think, I mean, we're, we're halfway through, we're more than halfway through rolling out the smart meter program, but that'll be there fairly quickly. We are building new interconnection with France and Britain and we'll build more, which they're the sort of key elements. They're, they're the key tools that give us the capability, I think, of of being flexible in demand and smart in the storage and in the grid side. It's kind of weak, geeky and wonky, and the public's not necessarily going to work it out every morning what's the best thing to do, but it'll be our job as energy researchers and policy makers to come up with the solutions to make that easy, to make that the norm. And, and I think we're well-placed to do it, and I think SAI's you know the the resources there have been massively increased, and and I think that's the right place to invest because it's it's the centre of the new economy, and and our our country can and will be good at it. Thanks, Minister um, Morgan. If I can jump to you, you've spoken and we spoke before about how the bulk of research into energy security is taken from the view of industrialised countries. Um, so I suppose two questions to you on that. How do we firstly ensure that the energy security discussion is framed with expert advice at the heart of it, but also how do we ensure that it's also taking the broader global view of clean energy access and research that is, uh, you know, pointed towards that? Yeah, Margie, look, it's a it's it's a great question, which, as you know, is a high compliment from an academic. Um, <laughs> The, the reality, I, I still believe, is that these geopolitical questions and domestic policy questions will trump the inputs of analysts and, and, and uh, um, scientists and researchers in, in what actually gets done in the short term. So our job as researchers is really to translate that work in a politically sophisticated way to policymakers. So, um, you know, I think that Ireland has every reason to be deeply interconnected with the global economy. Indeed, it's sitting in the, uh, as an island nation um, to be more and more connected. And, and the, of course, the history of Ireland's economy over the last 50 years shows the benefits of that in, in, in many ways and, and still does. Um, but convincing a, a voter at their kitchen table, as we say in, in the US, uh, that they should care about the plight of people in the global South, including in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, while most people would say that they, they do have some feeling and do care about th that plight when it comes to their the trade-offs that they might see at their kitchen table, those decisions become much, much more parochial or smaller uh, in, in, in the in the voting booth. So I th while I think it's wonderful to have uh, politicians like Minister Ryan and, and others, uh, especially in Europe, who understand the interconnected nature of society and how security in uh, Kenya or security in, in, in Southeast Asia matters for the security of, of Ireland. It's not always the case. And, and as we see in various rises in populism and uh, border um, closing borders figuratively or, 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 or in, with concrete, um, that's not always how things are, are being done. And so um, the, you know, just on, 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 it's interesting on this minerals side recently. So there was a coup, as you know, in Niger, well, it's ongoing or, or uh, depending on who your perspective is, it's either ongoing or finished. There's a coup, and they have 
uh, an enormous amount of uranium, which is of great interest to the energy transition. It's of great interest to the United States. Uh, and then there's uh, Gabon just had a coup and they have uh, significant amounts of different critical minerals and, and, and then ongoing governance issues from Nigeria to uh, Iran and Iraq to, uh, to, to Algeria and gas and Nigeria on oil and Iran and Iraq on oil. Um, these things are going to make those, those uh, more lofty and I think correct uh, aspirations around energy security and geopolitics. Um, well, from a researcher perspective, we call them interesting, right? They're they're far from interesting, though, for the people uh, under, uh, yeah. having to go through them. And so, um, I think keeping an eye for for researchers to keep an eye on the broader context is imperative. To keep uh, an eye on the reality of local or domestic politics is important, even for scientists. And um, uh, to, to, to maintain the, those kind of links is going to be the way that the, the research and analysis is most, uh, has the most impact it can. Okay, thanks, Morgan. Um, I'm gonna jump in, I'm conscious. Minister Ryan has joined us from uh, another commitment. Um, so I wanted to address the question out of Claire's conversation to you both. Um, I just wrote it down as she was speaking. So she said ensuring coherence of the energy trilemma is linked to a changing of order of the political priority from predominantly economic growth to one that places our life supporting planetary systems at the core. Um, so I suppose the question I'd have for both of you is, especially on the back of last year where energy security became so predominantly, at, I think William said earlier, it was at kitchen tables and CEO tables. It was in front of mind for everybody. Is it possible for us to secure energy supply without compromising climate ar action targets and, and still manage costs so it's an affordable, clean energy transition for, for those most vulnerable? So uh, that's a kind of a big question in terms of the change of political order and priority, um, but I'd, I'd really value your views. If I could go to you first, Minister. Good few thoughts if I can. Um, and I think Morgan's correct. Politics is the key here in terms of all the research, all the technology, all the if we don't get the politics and the story right, it's really challenging. Um, I think we did a major the EPA did a major study, climate in the Irish mind last early this year, at four thousand interviews, I think really broad scientific assessment. And the vast majority, about three or four percent were climate deniers, eighty-five percent wanted to see action sought as part of their uh, and I think you can see that sometimes, like you saw it in Europe in recent months, when there was a risk, some political actors, um, to use that American type phrase, were looking at scuppering the nature restoration law. And actually, the silent majority that you don't hear, the people at the kitchen table, actually woke up and said, well, hold on a sec, your nature is being destroyed, I want to protect it. And the vote swung at the last minute around. I have to hope, I mean, I, I, I do despair. I'm, I'm following on Washington next week, going to the UN for the week for the... UN General Assembly, and I must admit, American politics at the moment would absolutely scare you and depress you in terms of, you watch the first primary for the Republican election, and the first question is, hands up, who believes in climate change, and not a single person raises a hand. That is a truly worrying kind of reality that has to be confronted, in my mind, and I think it can be. I mean, I've, who is it to say about another country's politics? But in a world where you can see the impact of climate this summer in a way that it's hard to ignore. Uh, I, I fail to believe, I think the political course, correct course in the States must be to confront that kind of it being used as a identity divisive tool. And, and I do think we need to confront that. One other point, if I can make here and go back to what I was saying earlier on about like we do have to, part of the politics is making sure that you don't breach the affordability criteria so that you're not, you're not it's not so expensive that you just politically can't get it over the line. Uh, and I'm afraid I was, there was reading something, um, someone more introduced me, um, Michael Liebrecht, who set up New Energy Finance, now Bloomberg New Energy Finance. He has an article out last week, and he was making the point, which I think is a valid one, that the cost of transition towards this renewable, efficient future will be, 
relatively manageable for the first 90% of the transition. The last 10% could be as expensive. In other words, you have to provide all this backup power when you get to the, you know, the real balancing capability for periods when there's no wind or, or, or no sun or when, no, um, when you don't have access to renewables. And my sense on that is, I, I think what we need to do is get to the 80, 90 percent. And we can do that in Ireland relatively competitively and um, uh, relatively, you know, there are loads of benefits. We have comparative competitive advantage. We have so much wind, offshore wind particularly. And I think as we're doing that and, and going back to what I said at the very start about, you know, you need initiative learning by doing, admitting uncertainties like 15 years ago, who knew which way the cost of PV, the cost of batteries, the development of shale oil and gas and so on. So I think we let, let's get to the 80, 90 percent transition. And as we're doing that, we learn in terms of how you get that last bit. We'll, we'll be surprised by some of the technological developments that occur. And... And I do think that what Claire was saying is true. I think in the trilemma, I always say this in terms of, um, you know, classic energy trilemma, you have to have secure, competitive and clean power energy system. But actually, if you look at the metrics on that, on the clean side, there's no room for manoeuvre. It's the laws of physics now, atmospheric physics. And we can't delay. We can't. There's no option. Like it's it's a must do for everyone. Um, when it comes to security and cost, there's always alternatives. Like there's always different ways in which you can provide security through demand reduction or to alternative supplies or, or through alternative technologies. There's no alternative on the environment. And I think the trilemma is somewhat still, I, I think she's right in this sense from a policymaker's perspective, is that really we do have to put primacy of the, of the environmental leap now. Because our because the the atmospheric physics are starting to go awry completely, and and we really and we won't know if we've crossed a tipping point, but but we do have to, you know that that changes the dynamics in my mind of what what how that trilemma works. Uh, getting that political understanding of that and the public understanding of it is not easy. You won't do it by just scaring people or talking physics to them. It has to be inspiring a sense of a better, better sense of community, better sense of justice, better sense of a you know, better, safer place to raise a family in, in how we do this. So, so, but, but I do think um, she's right. We, the, the, the reality of what's happening in the weather systems now, I think, and to loss of natural systems require a different approach where where really we can't compromise on the environmental side. Thanks, Minister. Um, before I go over to you, Morgan, I'm, I'm conscious um, Mr. Arne may have to drop off uh, to a commitment before we finish out on the, on the answer to the question. So I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Arne, for giving your time. I know it was uh, we were pulling you out from something else so and your considered contribution i'm staying today. to the end here the oh good can... okay <laughs> brilliant okay morgan well then I'll, I'll go to you on that question that kind of big question that claire was yeah uh, you know I, I think you know given the minister's uh, trip here I, I guess for the for the un general assembly and new york climate week and and those points you know i i think the political attractiveness of energy security can help us transact the the the, the climate change imperative it, it, at least in a country like the united states um you, you 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 have a lot less chance of getting things done solely through a climate change lens as opposed to an energy security lens now so you know th that line, which I've been pushing for a while, uh, can seem like a uh, you know you're giving something away. In other words, let's change the perspective and say let's focus on energy security. Um, but the political power of energy security uh, is is tremendous in in some countries like the United States, and it's in my view, far stronger motivator for action than climate change is. The, 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 the direct impacts on people from a price perspective or from a risk perspective help make it so. Just in the same way that I think 
the motivators of air pollution or water pollution are more direct and stronger drivers than climate change for average voters or at the kitchen table. And so I, I think, at least in the US context, and this is not true everywhere, um, trying to transact through those more specific lenses can be more powerful and they can get to the same place or they can get at least close to the same place. So that, that's one thing to say as you as you come to the United States that, um, anyway, that's my, my cut on it. The, the second piece is that um, this idea that the United States and China won't uh, get into some sort of trade war uh, is now, the, the train has left the station, so to speak. So we are in a trade war and a very, very, difficult one. And the United States has put forward uh, some export controls that people may not have noticed, especially on um, advanced computer chips for AI and for military use that are extremely stringent and difficult. And the, actually, so far, the response by China has been uh, a fairly measured so they, 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 they've been talking about some export controls, but nothing to the level thus far that the United States has put on, on China, especially around those chips. Um, and that complicated dance between the United States and China is not going away, but it, it maybe it can be used for some good. In other words, um, it is one of the only bipartisan, in other words, the two parties in the United States system agreement it, it's it's one of the only areas of agreement that we want to do something about China. In other words, we, we want to be against China in some way. Now, you know, how you make that into something that's beneficial for both security, supply chain security, climate change, and energy security is no easy task. But remember that at the same time, the United States is ramping up clean energy supply from solar and wind and batteries. It's not like China's standing still. So they're investing massively in these technologies, especially clean technologies. And um, so I think from a political sort of salience, getting things done perspective, our government is in, uh, well, is a very difficult position to actually get anything done. And so you have to find the, 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 those small cracks of light um, where you can make a difference. And, and two of them happen to be the power of energy security and the power of bipartisan agreement on doing something about China. And so I think those levers, as they would say, in, in the World Bank are, are, are really worth pursuing uh, in, your, in your time in the US. But I think that they're also worth pursuing more, more widely in research and analysis. Thanks, Morgan. Um... Yeah, well, we could, we could keep talking for another half an hour. And two aspects I wanted to bring up there with, you know, small advanced open economy in Ireland and how these things will play out at home, but also the, the behavioral aspect around what you're talking about, how price shocks and, and large global shocks have really brought energy and that discussion to the fore in a way that environmental concerns has never actually managed to yet and and how do we continue the type of individual actions that have happened during when the break was put in our movements during COVID and 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 again when people reacted with heat demands in their homes how do we help those actions collectively to happen outside of global shocks if you don't view what we're going through in climate as a global shock but unfortunately we've run out of time this morning and I know a uh, great thank you to both of you really a minister for making uh, yourself available beyond what, what we thought possible and Morgan for tuning in in the wee hours as, as I said really really appreciate uh, this scene setting kind of global context to opening up the panel so a very big thank you to you both um, and uh, looking forward to considering those comments further throughout the day. So I'll say my goodbyes to you both and, and bring this session to a close. So thank you. Thank you both. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, well, that's great. Uh, 
for panel one. Uh, I hope you enjoyed setting a global context. Um, I understand, sorry, uh, very late in the day that questions were coming through, so apologies we didn't get to them with the Minister and Morgan. I will be keeping a close eye on it for our second panel. Um, we had planned on doing a short break here, but instead we're going to go straight into our second panel um, and uh, maybe give a few extra minutes at the coffee break later on at 11.15. Um, so our, our next panel takes this global conversation now into the context of sustainable energy in Ireland, uh, sorry, energy security in Ireland. What does it mean for us here at home? What are the shifting paradigms for national sustainable energy security, considering all of the variables that we've just spoken to in terms of a global context? So we're going to hear from three speakers first uh, with scene setting uh, speaking po points and then we'll open to the panel conversation where we will have audience participation in the Q&A so please do start uh, positioning your questions I have full visibility of them now um, and uh, we'll also be joined by a fourth panel member uh, later on for the discussion. Um, if you'd like a question directed to someone particularly on the panel, please do put that into the discussion and, and we'll try and, and direct it to the right person. Uh, I'll be keeping a close eye on, on them for now. So our first speaker is Cahal O'Cleary, my colleague, a Senior Energy Analyst with SEAI. Um, Cahal works at the heart of the team responsible for collating analysing and disseminating Ireland's national, national and sectoral statistics for energy. Um, and he's been directly involved in producing this data in an increasingly real-time and accessible means online. So I really encourage people to, after today, go in online to the various energy stats dashboards that are now available to play around with as well on SEI's website. So prior to joining SEI, Cahill worked as a consultant with Bernard O'Cleary in the areas of energy policy and management. Um, and he's going to be speaking to us now on an outlook on Ireland's energy security and our import dependency. So I'll hand over to you, Cahill. Thanks very much, Margie. And, uh... I hope that's coming through okay there. The um, apologies. Okay, thank you. So uh, my name is Carlo Ferrig. I'm senior energy analyst with Energy Statistics team uh, at SEAI. Our team is responsible for collecting, analyzing, and disseminating national energy statistics. We also fulfill Ireland's international uh, reporting requirements on energy statistics, reporting data to Eurostat and the IEA. And uh, a lot of the data that I'll be presenting today is provided to the EPA who produce Ireland's national greenhouse gas inventory. So I'd like to start by uh, mentioning that our team has conducted periodic studies on energy security in Ireland through the years. The last one was a few years ago, it was in 2020. Uh, that was based on data that predated the pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So today I'm going to give this presentation to provide you with a brief overview of updated statistics relating to Ireland's energy security and uh, some of the relevant energy projection data as well. I'd like to start with how uh, we define energy security and particular, the, particularly the definition set out by the IEA, which is sort of the basis uh, of our work on energy security. So. Um, the IEA defines it as ensuring the uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. Uh, and there are two as aspects to that, additional aspects. There's the long-term energy security, which is, involves the timely investments to supply energy in line with economic developments and environmental needs. And then there's the short-term energy security, which is the ability of an energy system to react promptly to sudden changes in supply and demand. So uh, really, I'd like to pick out the three sort of key aspects to this. Um, which are sort of availability or security of, of energy supply, the affordability and competitiveness, and also the environmental sustainability. So as some of our, uh, one of our speakers, at least one of our speakers has mentioned already, so this is sort of tying into the, the trilemma and the three pillars of energy policy being sustainability, affordability, and competitiveness, and security. Um, 
So there's significant interaction between each pillar. So any individual policy measure will likely impact more than just one. And there are many ways of thinking of this or, you know, illustrating the point. Uh, indeed, uh, Barry McMullen at DCU has suggested sort of a hierarchy that starts with sustainability as the foundation then goes through security of supply and then cost on top. But today, what I'd like to look at is um, the three pillars and what the 2022 data can tell us about each of the three. Uh, my color coding here is sort of my own subjective assessment of, of what's happened in 2022 in relation to each or what hasn't happened. So um, if we look at sustainability first, we have energy consumption increasing, we have uh, renewable energy share uh, more or less stagnating at around 13.1%. Uh, we have energy-related emissions decreasing slightly, but not nearly enough. Um, and we have, we're facing potential overruns in the carbon budget and the sectoral emission ceilings, which was uh, outlined earlier this year by the EPA. Uh, on the affordability and the competitiveness side, we saw price increases with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We saw obviously increased cost of businesses and households. Uh, we saw reduced residential consumption and industrial consumption of energy. Inflation, um, economy-wide inflation went up. Uh, there was a requirement for government supports for energy, uh, both for businesses and for households. And But we've seen something of a easing of prices in 2023, but it's uh, to be determined the exact extent of that. And on the... Um, Security side of things, we have import dependency increased again, fossil fuel price volatility, which ties into the affordability side of things, was obviously triggered by the Russian invasion. So the interacting aspects there. So here I'd like to go on to a Sankey diagram showing Ireland's 2022 energy flow. It'll show, it shows the indigenous production versus import split for each energy type a breakdown of the energy supply by each energy type and a summary of the sectoral demand. I'm not going to go through all the detail provided here, but um, just to point out that Ireland's import dependency was 80% in 2022. So it's, it's increased quite a bit in recent years. Um, you can see here the various energy types down through the middle. So we have oil, which uh, makes up the largest share, almost half of primary energy. It's 66% of imports and it, it is all imported. Uh, on natural gas, we have makes up about 31% of primary energy, 25% of imports, and it's uh, three quarters of it is imported. Um, only 25% of our gas is, is comes from indigenous production. Uh, and then on the, I will skip over coal and peat, which um, are relatively small, uh, but um, coal obviously being all imported and peat being indigenously produced still. Um, so renewables, we have 13% of, uh, makes up about 13% of primary energy, only 1% of imports and about 9% of renewables is imported. That is mostly in liquid biofuels and a small amount of solid biomass. And then here I just have the, the uh, percentage uh, of final consumption for each of the sectors, transport being the biggest, followed by residential industry services. Uh, exports, we do export, um, it's mostly residual oil from refining. We also export small amounts of other fuels, including a small amount of electricity, but we are a net importer of electricity. So Ireland's import dependency has increased in recent years um, um, following uh, uh, in the early 90s, it grew from about 70% up to 85 to 91%. It then peaked in 2016 and then uh, began to drop. So there was a growth in demand and a decline in production in the 90s. We had indigenous uh, sources of gas decreased. Um, the lowest with carb gas field came online and uh, this reduced our import dependency to a low of around 67% in 2018. Since then, we've seen a decline in gas from the carb. So our import dependency has increased again. Uh, and sorry, and uh, Compared to the EU average, we're above it, but it's important to note that there's a significant variation in, in individual member states across the EU. Um, Ireland sits towards the um, 
higher end of the table when it comes to import dependency for EU member states. Uh, some of the less import dependent countries have clear comparative advantages uh, arising from things like abundant indigenous resources of fossil fuels, so like Denmark and, and Romania. We have uh, hydro in Sweden and France, history of using biomass for heating in Finland, and uh, ambitious policies for renewable sources like in Denmark and nuclear energy in France. So it's also worth pointing out that all EU states are net importers of energy. So here, just digging a little bit deeper, we have um, Ireland's indigenous production and its net imports together. So this is basically the gross available energy to, to, our, to Ireland in each year. And uh, starting from the bottom, we have indigenous renewables, which we can see have been slowly, steadily growing um, since the early 2000s. On top of that, we have uh, indigenous non-renewable, which has fluctuated, as I spoke to about the gas and uh, commercial peat harvesting has ceased. On top of that, we have a small sliver of net imports of renewables. And then we have what dominates uh, Ireland's energy supply, which is the net import of non-renewables, mostly oil and gas. So we can see here, we have an increase in demand post COVID. We have a slow renew rollout of renewables since 2020. Uh, as a, there was actually a decrease in 2021 and a slight increase again in 2022. We've seen a decline in gas production uh, in Ireland as well. So now I'd like to talk about just briefly on affordability. Um, this graph shows the domestic energy prices up to the end of 20, sorry, at the end of 2022. Uh, it shows um, gas, electricity, heating, solid fuel and wood pellets. In particular, I'll point out that electricity, which is the blue line at the top, and the gas uh, are the average domestic rates. Um, I don't need to go into detail about uh, with the exact percentages of the increases, but it's important to say that all energy fuel types um, increased in 2022. And this for, for householders. So this resulted, um, well, one of, the main, one of the main aspects that, that contributed to a 12% reduction in residential energy, demand, energy consumption. And we know that that, that there was a 12% reduction. What we don't know is how that, that reduction was distributed. It's likely that some households did not change their consumption pattern at all, while others were forced to make significant reductions. So while we need to see reductions in energy, energy consumption, it cannot be at the expense of people going cold or slipping into energy poverty. So um, lastly, I'd like to cover um, is SEAI's national energy project projections, which are prepared by my colleagues in a different team in energy modeling. And uh, they are prepared in collaboration with the EPA. They're used to inform the debate on future energy trends and to assist government in measuring progress towards targets and taking corrective action if necessary. This slide presents two scenarios of future energy use with existing measures, WEM, and uh, with additional measures, WAM. WEM WEM scenario is a projection of future energy use based on policies and measures currently implemented and actions committed to by government. The with additional measures scenario is more ambitious and it takes future, it is a projection of future energy use based on measures outlined in the latest government uh, climate action plan. So we see uh, a relatively modest increases in both scenarios in, pri in total primary energy demand for Ireland. But when it comes to natural gas, we can see quite quite a difference. We see both cases, natural gas uh, consumption would peak in around 2025, 2026, uh, but oil demand would decrease significantly um, from this year. Um, on top of that, uh, just like to touch on what fills the gap of that oil and gas, we have net electricity generation um, increasing significantly from about 32 terawatt hours up to 47 to 54 terawatt hours in 2030. And that primarily comes from renewables. So increasing the renewable energy share and electricity from about 38% where it is 39% at the moment up to uh, 68 to 82% uh, in 2030, depending on the scenario question. Um, so more details will be upcoming in SEAI's uh, 
National Energy Protection Report, which is due out, I believe, in the next month or so. So keep tuned, stay tuned for that. And um, finally, I just like to leave with this, this that it's improving energy efficiency and increasing the speed of renewables deployment will support all three pillars. Uh, I think that's it's fairly obvious and simplistic maybe to say that, but that's the thought I'll leave you with at the moment. Thank you. Apologies, I think I just did a, a no mute on mute again. So look, thanks, Carl, uh, for that. That really does create the picture um, of uh, where we are in terms of dependence and uh, in terms of our energy security and our reliance on others, and, and also starts us thinking about how do you ensure the security of the new renewables. Um, before I introduce our uh, next speaker, i uh, just been asked to mention if anyone's watching via the uh, live YouTube link, will you head to the Forma Conference platform? You should have a link has been sent out to you on that because that's where the Q&A is located. So you'll have full visibility of being able to post questions and I have full visibility now. I can see there were a couple of questions that were posted uh, very relevant to the uh, Minister and Morgan's piece. Um, I'll see if I can work them into the uh, further conversation where we can and apologies I didn't see them. Um, okay so next we will hear from Izzy Petrie. Uh, Izzy is, is with the Society of St Vincent de Paul. Um, she's the Research and Policy Officer at the Vincent de Paul and the Social Justice team and she draws on the experience of their members work with supporting people facing poverty. Um, prior to that she's worked uh, largely in the social justice side with a, a range of organizations and she's going to be speaking to us now about taking concrete action to combat energy poverty. So recent developments on our challenges ahead. So I'll hand over to you Izzy. Thanks very much, Margie, um, and thanks for having me uh, at the, the conversation in this, um, this session today. Uh, so as Margie just said, um, I'm going to start with uh, talking about the impact of energy prices um, over the last year or so um, during this, this kind of period of very high prices on people in energy poverty um, and reflect, um, I suppose, on what that might tell us or teach us um, about the challenges ahead and the years ahead. Um, so to very quickly introduce um, SVP, St Vincent de Paul is a voluntary organisation, um, the largest voluntary organisation in Ireland, and our members uh, work within their local communities um, to support people facing poverty and social exclu exclusion who uh, seek our assistance. So last year we received um, around 230,000 requests for assistance. Um, and that led to us kind of amongst other types of support and other activities, um, assisting people um, with meeting their food costs, um, costs around education and also utility costs. Um, so to, to focus um, on, on the energy, on the energy crisis and, and the impact there on people in energy poverty, um, the kind of the change and the impact over the last year, focusing on 2022, um, couldn't be clearer really than in these these national statistics on deprivation. Um, we saw kind of um, enforced deprivation go up overall across the range of deprivation measures, but we did see extremely striking increases on the energy deprivation measure side of things. Um, so we saw double the amount of people who are in households who were unable to keep their homes adequately warm, um, as well as seeing kind of really significant increases in people who had uh, been behind on their utility bills at least once and who had gone um, without heating at home due to kind of affordability. Um, so we saw these risks kind of heavily concentrated um, amongst different groups. Um, so we saw very high in terms of household type, we saw um, extremely high rates for one parent families, high rates and very high increases as well. Um, and then in terms of people's kind of um, employment or economic status, um, we saw very high rates and high increases for people who are unemployed and people unable to work um, due to health. 
So these sort of national trends and national um, statistics, what we can see from those very much reflect what we see at SVP and the experience of SVP members. Um, so last year, 2022, um, we saw an increase of 40% uh, in people requesting um, help um, to do with energy and energy costs. Um, and that was within an overall increase in requests for assistance. And we're kind of seeing that um, trend continue this year. So total calls, total requests for assistance um, so far this year are up again 14% on 2022. And we can see that is driven both by people having kind of energy needs and requesting energy assistance, but also, you know, we're now really seeing the impact of rising um, food costs. So I suppose what struck us um, as prices began to climb and we started seeing those announcements was the particular risks facing prepay customers. Um, there's an immediacy there as soon as the unit price increases for people, uh, for prepay customers, um, the same amount of money, the top up just doesn't stretch the same amount of days. So people either have to make cutbacks um, on other essentials elsewhere in the budget or the meter cuts out. Um, I suppose the, the equivalent for a, customers, uh, bill pay customers, uh, the corresponding challenge there is the kind of the stress around the repayment of very significant bills and bills that have just completely shocked people. Um, and also that kind of the fear element of not knowing what's coming in the next bill. Um, and we're now seeing people very much not able to keep up with multiple bill cycles in a row. Um, we also support a lot of households and have supported a lot of households um, who use uh, heating oil as their kind of primary heating source. Um, and so there's a real challenge there and has and has been previously as well around needing that significant lump sum of money to fill the tank. And when there isn't that money, the tank goes empty. Um, and then there's also people who'd either kind of rely on solid fuel where costs have gone up, as it's just been mentioned, or they would fall back on, on solid fuel as well. And members really see the, the impact this has on people, um, people having to, to cut back on, on the most basics and the essentials, kind of hot water, using the cooker, um, people, if they, many people don't turn the heating on, but if they do, they might use a kind of uh, a heater in one room, people kind of um, having to go to bed early to stay warm. And that has... Um, real impacts on people's physical health and also on their mental health. It has financial impacts and there are also kind of wider public health implications um, on people being forced to use these kind of coping mechanisms. So earlier in the year, um, we commissioned a piece of research um, which included a survey looking at the extent of hardship um, people were experiencing as well as um, focus groups to kind of dig further into uh, people's experience of struggling with their energy costs and how they kind of sought support. Um, the survey aspect showed the, the real extent of the sharp end of hardship um, with people cutting back on essential spending for their utility bills and people rationing their kind of electricity use their, and their heating use um, and, and going without entirely and people relying more on solid fuel um, due to mains heating costs. Uh, and I suppose the real life experience of this is people, and then this is quoting the research, being more conscious, uh, more aware and budgeting for energy. But despite these um, these behaviours or these approaches, still really feeling the impacts of energy poverty. So the idea of the bill staying with you throughout the months and as, as, as kind of winter continues as a fear and a worry, um, or people managing their and reducing their energy use to um, such an extent that in, in the la last quote and last speech bubble there, when my parents know I'm coming home, um, they have all the lights and the heating on, but if I stop by unannounced, they're in one room with the super set on. So to turn now to, I suppose, policy and research and looking at our, our collective response um, to these price rises and to the experiences of people. Um, so I've just listed a few of the interventions um, to support people over the, over the last year to show, I suppose, the breadth of ways different organisations um, have intervened. And SVP and our members very much saw the impact of these interventions um, from additional social welfare payments um, through to the home upgrades 
but we are still seeing the increasing numbers of people struggling and kind of increasing depth of hardship for some people. So what lessons do we need to take from those interventions as we kind of continue with high prices through this winter with prices staying very high, but also um, going forward? So fundamentally, uh, people most at risk do, uh, from these, these higher prices that we've been seeing are people who simply don't have enough um, money to make any adjustments in their budget. Uh, core social welfare rates didn't keep up with inflation. And whilst those once off and time limited supports do help, um, they don't form a kind of reliable foundation for households to budget around for, for you know, the coming winter and coming years. Um, so the, ne the next point is about targeting and making sure our resources are supporting those most in need. Um, responses and support also require flexibility and being able to work with the range of circumstances people are in. Um, we need to be able to provide personalised advice to people that recognises the complexity of the factors that lead to energy poverty. Um, and we need to move towards those long term solutions um, that build resilience, both kind of systemically and for households. Um, so to start to wrap up. I'm just going to expand on a few of those points with a slide about the kind of policy features that we think are important for future developments in the energy system and how those um, features interact with people and work with people um, in energy poverty. And then I'll just move on to a few um, research kind of ideas or avenues. So importantly, we need to provide people with stability uh, and a guarantee that people will be able to meet their essential needs, including their energies energy needs and that goes in in terms of both energy prices and also the income and income supports that we provide for people. So we need to focus on gaps in our social infrastructure um, as we work through this uh, energy transition and make sure we're focused on building that resilience. So a couple of gaps that we would see clearly is a specific energy consumer advocacy role that has both expertise in the energy market and the changing market and in consumer experience. Um, and we continue to highlight the need for kind of personalized wraparound energy advice. And connected to those services is the challenge of visibility and knowing who needs support with what in good time, especially as the system changes and we move towards kind of decarbonisation and more digital kind of energy lives and energy experiences. Um, and finally, we need to make sure there is equity in how we support people uh, in our systems and all the different interventions. Are we making sure we're reaching everyone um, and reaching the furthest behind first? Um, and this applies in a lot of situations. But as an example, we would be very concerned about private renters and energy poverty. So we think of benefit there would be having um, an energy poverty target and sub targets and making sure we're kind of monitoring the achievements and the gaps for different groups to make sure we're on the right track. Um, so to finish with, I've got a few kind of suggestions, uh, ideas for avenues for future research. So firstly, um, and importantly, I think from SVP's perspective, particularly over the last year or so, I think we do need further understanding of the qualitative experiences of the energy market, and in particular for consumers who are at risk and who have experienced the worst outcomes. So that's, I think, digging a little deeper into different payment arrangements, how different households navigate them at different times in their life, the life cycle as things come up, uh, different tenures, um, and also how people with disabilities or ill health kind of face uh, different challenges. And kind of continuing that theme, when we are introducing new technology going forward, I think we need to make sure um, we are aware of monitoring. We know not just how one type of kind of customer or consumer rules will respond, but how it will work uh, for different types of people and interact with different kind of circumstances. And I think that starts to touch on things like participation in the planning process, as well as kind of research projects. Um, so thirdly, uh, I think we need to kind of be imaginative in how we come up with new ways to support people within our existing systems and within new systems. Um, and I think that applies to kind of technologies as well as our social systems and our supports there. So how do our advice systems work? How do we um, incorporate the voice of consumers and um, kind of the public? Um, and just finally, I, I think we need to kind of use that wealth of experience that people have, that kind of day to day granular knowledge that people have of their interaction with the energy system, um, including people in energy poverty and sort of design future solutions and systems with those people and with with us. Thanks very much. Thanks, Izzy. Um, you know, really 
uh, pertinent points for the discussion. Looking forward to drawing out in them more later, but it really just points to the importance between yourself and Cahill's uh, presentations to having the data available to be able to inform decisions and discussions around best pathways forward. So thank you for that. Um, Last but certainly not least, our, our last speaker for this session is Vice Admiral DSM Mark Mellet. Um, Mark has retired from his military career, but he was the highest ranking military officer, the government's principal military advisor and a member of the National Security Committee. Um, and he's uh, most recently, I suppose, appointed by government as the chair of MARA. So that's the Maritime Area Regulatory Authority, I'm sure. Many here will know that it's the new state agency for the regulation of development and activity in Ireland's maritime area. So he has served at home and abroad and brings a, a wealth of experience in some of the questions that we've talked about already this morning um, from his experiences throughout his career. So he's going to speak to us today about realising Ireland's offshore potential in achieving energy security. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mark. Just checking uh, to share my screen here. Have you got it? Okay. Yeah, it's not allowing me to do so. Have you got my sides there that you could push on for me? Yeah, it's not allowing me to share. Should be able to share them by email. I'll ask Claire. Share. When I, I press share, it's just saying send link. Send. No, it's not. Um... No. Drew, we'll arrange for emailing the deck to you, um, Mark. Would you be comfortable starting I will agree, um, yeah. to speak on the present? We'll try and get the slides up for you. Is that please? So, yeah, I, I, I actually sent them in um, to Claire. So, it should be listen, I, I'll drive on and we, we can um, uh, speak without them. I suppose the important point is that it's just been a very interesting discussion up to this point. And um, the key point I think it was made by Minister Ryan was the link between energy security and climate security. And I'd actually bring in human security in that. Um, and I'm going to pose a couple of questions at the end of my uh, presentation and in fact, uh, look at the issue of research areas for focus and some of the policy needs and enablers. But first of all, just a few points on the climate crisis itself. Um, I grew up in the West of Ireland and um, Back then, uh, I remember as a youngster, we used to bring international community on the Castlebar four-day walks. And um, we went out through an area in North Mayo through Croke Moyle. And at the top of Croke Moyle, I could look out and see the Atlantic. Uh, and all around the area where I was, where I saw a bog, um, those who visited saw an ecosystem. They saw heathers, they saw ferns, they saw... Um, I suppose the richness of it. And um, I looked out at the Atlantic and I didn't realize then that I was going to spend much of my career in the Atlantic uh, working with the Naval Service. I didn't realize then also that every time I took a breath of air, I was breathing just um, 313 parts per million in terms of carbon. I didn't realize that throughout the ocean in the years that would follow that a rich, vulnerable marine ecosystems like cold water coral uh, habitated the whole uh, western break of our area. And these were associated with rich fisheries like orange ruffy. 
Um, these are all gone now. And in fact, much of the ecosystem has uh, been destroyed. These vulnerable marine ecosystems in, like cold water coral would take up to 4,000 years to um, form and they could be destroyed within three minutes. Uh, back when I was a kid looking out, these orange ruffy, some of those same fish that were below the surface of the sea were alive when Darwin was on the Beagle. They lived to be over 200 years of age. They've all been destroyed. So we've moved to a point whereby we have a collapsed and dying ecosystem today, which real challenges in terms of where we go uh, with real concerns over overshoot. We've seen in the last um, 50 years or so, a 65% loss of vertebrate life. We've seen a 75% loss in insects, including pollinators, in the last 30 years. Significant loss in terms of rainforest and vulnerable marine ecosystems like cold water coral. And I think in the last um, 11 days, we've seen in eight devastating flooding events on four continents in Libya, in Greece, in Turkey, in Brazil, in Spain, in China, Hong Kong, and the US. And so we really are at a very challenging point today. And I heard earlier speakers talk about the issue with regards to um, our attempts on the reduction of greenhouse gases. We're still up around 37 billion, billion metric tons being emitted. Uh, we are making some progress and in the last three years or so, we were to project that into the future, we will achieve net zero in about uh, 2076. At, what, at that stage, we will have reached about 486 parts per million, uh, a significant increase of where we are at the moment, where we are is about 420. So it is a really worrying concern for us. And I don't need to speak to you about the actual temperature uh, rise. Uh, we're at about 1.2%. We're certain to overshoot the Paris requirement of 1.5 uh, degrees. It could even go up to about um, 2.5 or 2.7 degrees, which leaves us in a very challenging position. There is an inextricable link, as I said, between climate and between security. And each year, the World Economic Forum uh, publish a list on, on the top security challenges. And in the last uh, 22, the top three were climate related. And in 2023, in the next 10 year progress, the, 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 the top uh, six are climate related including the issue of irregular migration. And I tra tragically, my own career have seen the impact of people who are forced because of climate to migrate. In the last number of years, the Defence Forces have rescued over 22,000 people in the Mediterranean. We've seen hundreds of people drown. We've recovered many bodies. And unfortunately, this type of tragic event is set to rise into the future. We've also seen in mission areas such as Mali, whereby the real challenges with regards to traditional methods of living, such as the Fulani pastoralists versus Dugan farmers who are in conflict because of declining resources. And I'm recently back from Malawi, where I've seen a country that is um, really been uh, badly hit by the impact of climate change, in particular, uh, cyclonic conditions coming in from the Indian Ocean, hitting that country like never before. But we're at a situation whereby we're at a, a, an opportunity. And if there is one upside of the Ukraine war, it has driven that uh, focus within the EU on the issue of strategic autonomy and self-sufficiency and energy. Uh, we have spoken about Repower EU and the Green Deal. And the reality is Ireland is in an extraordinary position in the context of its capacity to contribute to that. We live, uh, I suppose, approximate and close to the richest accessible renewable energy resource on the planet. Right across the northern Atlantic, we have um, regular wind speeds in excess of 10 meters per second. And if you look at it from an accessibility point of view, there are three or maybe four. There is the west coast of the US. There is the Atlantic itself. There is an area in the center of the Asian continent. And there is an area to the uh, east of Japan. But the closest, uh, and by the way, the area in the continent is on the Himalayas, so we're not going to be able to leverage that. In the Southern Ocean, there are massive areas of renewable energy all along the Roaring Forties, but there are no people living there. The richest population centers adjacent to the richest renewable energy resource are actually to the west coast of Ireland. And I think that's really good to see in terms of how government plans are progressing towards leveraging this. We've seen it in phase one of our um, OREDP and the ORES scheme, whereby we, I suppose, had an auction with about 86 
euros per megawatt hour and about three uh, gigawatts going to be delivered from that. Uh, there's going to be another uh, three gigawatts are uh, delivered in terms of the, uh, or between phase two and phase three, there will be another potential three gigawatts with regards to uh, offshore renewables in the designated marine area plan to the south coast. And the green hydrogen requirement of two gigawatts uh, will be realized in phase three. And this all points towards uh, the rollout of technologies uh, along the east coast, along the south coast, and ultimately in the future framework towards the west coast of Ireland, with significant potential with a further 30 gigawatts on top of the uh, plan seven gigawatts of renewable energy. Technology is evol evolving in the context of the um, resources that are available to us. And while the current uh, reality is focused on, on wind energy, there are exciting developments in other areas such as wave and tidal. Uh, there is a significant multiplying factor should wave energy eventually arrive as a, a viable renewable energy source. And my own experience is it, it will come. In the past, wave energy has overpromised and underdelivered, but there are significant exciting uh, indicators that full scale deployments with success into the grid are now being realized in certain jurisdictions. And there are opportunities for that such a uh, I suppose, deployments in the, in the Irish area itself. I suppose looking at it from the point of view of uh, Ireland, uh, we have almost a million square kilometres where we have sovereign rights or potential sovereign rights. And that extends right out towards the jurisdiction, uh, well out to the west of Ireland, right up towards Rockall Hatton. So moving towards, I suppose, my two key areas in the context of um, the opportunity from the point of view of realizing this renewable energy, but secondly, I suppose having greater coherence in terms of how we leverage that. Ireland probably needs about seven gigawatts of energy to electrify its grid, but it also needs about another seven gigawatts of energy for e-fuels and sustainable aviation fuels. And it probably needs another seven gigawatts of renewable energy to actually cover other areas that can't be electrified, such as heavy uh, plant machinery, uh, maritime transport and so on. And that's in the region of between 24 and 25 gigawatts of renewable energy before we export even one electron of energy. So I think an interesting, and this is my first key message area for research would be to focus on an innovation policy that facilitates the prototype testing and demonstration uh, from renewable energy through energy park. And I'm talking about building in the AMET site in terms of the Atlantic Marine Energy Test Site, perhaps Galway Bay, incorporating offshore renewable energy, wave, wind and tidal, but also looking at the interface then between that and the production of green hydrogen, also linking that with carbon capture and sequestration, ultimately then the production of e-fuels. E-fuels, for those who don't know, are ultimately a green hydrogen with a carbon molecule impregnated in it. And this gives you methanol and ethanol. And these can actually be used then for aviation fuel. We need to look at new generation grid as part of this, I suppose, a demonstration a innovation policy. And finally, we need to look at the area of defense and security uh, technologies. My second, uh, I suppose, policy enabler then is to look at how we can achieve greater cross-cutting integrated maritime policy coordination and implementation in the state. In my experience, Ireland does silos very well, and we really need to look at the capacity for cross-government, the ability to pull together the disparate institutions who are in this space, uh, often separated by government departments, our institutions themselves, our independent bodies, and how we can actually create the cross-cutting mechanisms for the likes of SEAI to work with Marine Spatial Planning, to work with DEC, National Parks and Wildlife Service, DAFM, and the Maritime Area Regulatory Authority, and ultimately bringing in defence and security so that we have a teamwork and a joined up approach to dealing with our energy security requirements, our climate security requirements, and ultimately making that final link back to human security. Ultimately, there are three social systems that must come together. They're about government and good policy. They're about civil society and the, the understanding with regards to the institutions of ENGOs. And finally, they're about stimulating the market. And the market doesn't always tell the ecological truth, but bringing this trilogy together is actually the way we can actually have biodiversity net gain, we can have sustainability, 
and we can have energy security. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, and um, <clears throat> thank you so much. <clears throat> excuse me for managing without your slides as well. Well done, uh, they're a professional job. Uh, one of the great things about um, uh, doing our conference online is is the reach in which we get. Uh, we have a huge number attending today, but unfortunately, it does mean sometimes <laughs> that we um, we uh, don't necessarily uh, we have issues around slide sharing. So apologies to you, Mark. Anyway, look, thanks to everybody. Um, as I invite everyone back, I think you can see all uh, four of our panelists now. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to welcome our fourth member. Uh, Justina Corcoran. Uh, Justina is the head of the Retail Energy Policy and Regulation Division with the Department of the Environment, Climate and Communications and uh, has very kindly joined us for this discussion. Um, Justina recently joined the energy side of DEC from the climate side and has worked for a long time in the Just Transition piece. So to echo, I think, uh, Izzy's piece and also Mark, you touched on it as well. Um, so. Justina, I suppose, has uh, a real great perspective from being on the policy side uh, to support the most vulnerable to be fossil free first. So very warm welcome to you, Justina. Um, as we kick off the panel, um, I'd really like to encourage you all to use the Q&A function. <clears throat> Hopefully people who are on YouTube, you're, you're back on now and I am already seeing some questions come through here, so I, I will keep a very close eye on them. Um, beforehand though, um, we heard a, a very deaf different definition of any energy security throughout this morning and its evolving identity and the real challenges that we have to supporting the most vulnerable to deliver on this clean energy access transition whilst ensuring we keep all the lights on at the same time. Um, Carl, you, you spoke to our dependency on imports. Um, that that we're very heavily dependent, really. And in one way, that's quite a secure, in one view, when you look at some of the uh, renewable pieces that will be playing out, like subsea infrastructure, et cetera, that, that's not fully in play yet. So what do you think, in your view, are the biggest challenges for sustainable energy security in Ireland in the shorter term? In the shorter term, I guess it's, it's to reduce our, as we see from the uh, my colleagues' energy projections, we can see that we need to reduce uh, oil dependency immediately. So um, we need to displace the oil that we use in transport and in heating. We need to electrify those where we can and reduce our use as well. And as, as well as that, we need to accelerate the development and the deployment of renewables in Ireland, uh, specifically like um, wind and solar. And uh, I think to meet the ambitious, you know, as we said, you know, our carbon budgets and the sectoral emission ceilings are in jeopardy, but to meet uh, our targets under CAP 23, we really need to accelerate the rollout of um, renewables. Right, thanks, Cahill, and, and we'll touch on that in a minute with you, Mark. I think you spoke to some real opportunities that are there for us to be able to accelerate. Um, but I might go to you, Izzy, first, because you spoke about some of the biggest challenges experienced for those in energy poverty in very recent times. It really brought it front of mind for us all. Um, and you went through uh, uh, examples of levers um, that could could and should be considered. What's the one area, if you had to jump on one, <laughs> that you would think needs the most focus to ensure that supports are targeted to the most those that most need it? Thanks, Margie. Um, that's a difficult question to, to start off with. Um, the one, I think it's really... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> am I am I just going to talk around the question and not answer the question? No, and I it's think hard because so there's such a plethora, <laughs> isn't there? But uh, yeah. if, if you really had to land on it, what what would you concentrate on first? 
So I, I think the difficulty is, is that we can think of energy poverty as being like at the intersection of our energy efficiency and our housing systems, our kind of low income and people being in poverty and our income systems, and then the cost of energy. And we really do need to work across all of those things if we are to lift people out of energy poverty, because for every household, there is a different combination of those things going on. Um, I think we do just have to be able to guarantee that people can meet their essential needs. Um, I think that that is just the kind of baseline of a reasonable expectation that we should be able to offer people. And part of that is people should have income adequacy and we need to have a kind of base level of income adequacy in our social welfare systems and for everyone. Um, but I'm just, I'm just gonna nip to, I really think we need community energy advice. We need to be able to offer people tailored support in their energy needs. And that kind of then connects to all these different solutions. Currently, those three kind of factors in energy poverty can all be treated quite disparately for people, but they're kind of fully integrated in people's lives. So I think we do need that kind of system that people can go, I'm struggling. I need, you know, I need, I don't know what there is out there to help me. So it's kind of that first point of call that then can connect people up with um, kind of other solutions. Okay. Thanks, Izzy. And it does point to this kind of wicked problem from a research perspective and the very different disciplinarities that feed in you. You've got innovations on trying to accelerate deployment of renewables, but you've also got a lot to learn in terms of the economic and behavioral piece to really understand how society can move with that technology um, deployment. Justina, I might jump to you then because we spoke um beforehand on uh the so you you're obviously coming from this very much from the policy perspective and you have research currently underway on understanding energy poverty can you tell us more about that how did it come about and and what's happening okay so thanks and, and always good to hear from from izzy and to to get that perspective um, so we, the, the government in 2023 had a big cost to live in package, 2.5 billion, and 1.2 billion of that was for the energy credit, which went on every account, brilliant scheme, 99% success rate, but it wasn't targeted, it's universal, everyone got it, and so that's, you know, unfair to some people on one end who don't need it, and there's other people who probably need a little bit more, and so we want to target that. Um, but then we go to look and see, well, how do we target? Who, who do we give it to? And we realise that, oh, we've got, there's loads of different ways we could do it, but none of them seem completely fair, equitable. And one of the issues we have is that we currently don't have a good definition for energy poverty. As it stands, the definition we use in Ireland is that it's 10% of your income. If, if more than 10% of your income is spent on energy bills, then you meet the definition of energy poverty. So you could have somebody in a huge house um, with really high heat and bill and they're paying more than 10% of their um, income, but they have lots of income left, so they don't need it. And on the other end, you might have somebody who has a low income base, but they're not turning on the heat. Heat. They're in, sitting in the cold because they're afraid to turn on the heat or they can't afford to turn on the heat. And so they're falling outside the definition. So it's it's very blunt um, and it doesn't it doesn't really do it doesn't really help us in, in targeting those supports. Um, and the SRI did some study on that and they said with the crisis, there's now about 30 percent of people who would meet that definition. But still, it's it's still too crude. So uh, Izzy alluded to it there. One of the, the key measures that's actually missing out of that, one of the key metrics we're looking at is around energy efficiency. And um, that's not taken into to, to that um, calculation at all. And there's other measures as well. So the SRI um, are doing um, some research on behalf of the department. And it's around that whole definition of energy poverty and to come up with a, a new workable definition for Ireland now. As with research, it will take time. It's a three-year project. There's, they're well into it now. There's a year and a bit gone. Um, and the current piece of work that they're um, looking at, and there will be something out on this later on in the year, is they've been working very closely with the CSO and they were working with the survey on income and living conditions and the BRRRR and the, the, the energy rating um, data. So they've been matching those two databases together um, and 
the ASRI that work is done and the ASRI is now um, analysing that data. And so that will look at the relative contribution of income and energy efficiency. And there will be a paper out on that later in the year. So that should give us, you know, that's kind of the, the interim piece that we're looking at. But yeah, it is it is very difficult. And it's one of the biggest challenges is having that piece of robust data that will allow us to, to target those supports um, better. Thanks, Justine. And before I jump to you, Mark, uh, that's re it's really interesting, I think, because it's a real interface between research and policy where policy is really helping to support, support you. How, how does that process work for you in the best way, do you think, coming from a policymaker perspective, like getting that information into your hands in the most assumable, kind of a, um, assimilable way? Like, how does that work for you? The, the, for me, I've just from, from my, the experience I had working on the, the climate side of the house, so I looked after the National Dialogue on Climate Action and the minister referenced one piece of research there that was done was on the, the EPA did a huge piece of research, 4,000 people, um, climate in the Irish mind. But we also then engaged with all of society and we had four, over 4,000 responses there and we had loads of stakeholder groups and we had loads, so we had loads of data, we had all the data in the world and we had it held centrally. And so it was no use to us, you know, we weren't the ones writing the chapters, we're not the ones writing the policy for the climate action plan. And across our department, there's 20 and other departments, there's 20 pen holders, 22 pen holders um, who are each responsible for drafting a chapter in the climate action plan. And because that has to be done on an annual basis, that process is just always ongoing. And so you have a very, very short window when you know that those people are starting their drafting and they're looking around. And it's that timely piece. You need to have your outputs from those processes. You need to have your outputs from the research ready and to hand it to them at that point, because it's only then that their mind is in that place, it's focused and it's going to go in. So at that timely piece for me is the most important. Like there's, you can have all the research there, but it, it, it really needs to feed into policy on, and a policy obviously needs to be open to, to receiving it, but it, it does need to feed in on that that timely basis is what um, was the, the biggest piece for, for me. Great, thanks, Justina. Um, I can see loads of questions bubbling in. I'll, I'll go to them in one minute. I just wanted to go to one question first with you, Mark. Um, we very aware, and, and and as you spoke to the real potential of offshore for energy for Ireland, where what it, how can serve us at home and, and potentially abroad. Are there any particular challenges that you've identified from your previous, your military side role that are serious energy security considerations for wind energy? And what do you think can be done to support overcoming them? Yeah, there are there are challenges. It's, it's an open story that um, certainly the Russian Federation has been monitoring uh, interconnectors. It has been carrying out surveillance of uh, wind farm locations. Uh, not necessarily in our jurisdiction, but other jurisdictions. And I think that um, I suppose the offshore critical infrastructure will become part of a, a hybrid uh, target into the future. That being said, we have to look at the capabilities required, not just in our own jurisdiction, but other jurisdictions, so that we have a coherence in terms of the delivery of surveillance a recognised maritime picture and the ability to actually protect these uh, installations. There is a national responsibility from a sovereign perspective. There is a responsibility also from a developer perspective. And I think the marriage there is going to be something that should be brought into the discussion into the future. And in the innovation and demonstration idea I suggested earlier on, um, my, my view is that we should be looking at championing the, the joined up piece around this in terms of demonstration projects. But there's no doubt that uh, the requirements for our offshore renewable energy to land into our jurisdiction will need investments in the order of tens to hundreds of billions of euros in the decades ahead. And this becomes a critical piece of the energy architecture, not just for Ireland, but for Europe. And the issue of um, the export side of renewable energy, we have many years ahead of us whereby we will require every electron that comes ashore in terms of renewable energy. So I, I'd rather focus on the domestic requirements to bring in ORES-1, which is going to give us three gigawatts. And the aim is to have that as soon as possible. Uh, that's mainly the four uh, planned uh, successful projects 
on the east coast and also on the scare the rocks and then move into ORES 2 and ultimately phase three with the two gigawatts for green hydrogen. But there is a security penalty with that. And we need to look at that in the context of how we address providing that reassurance uh, to developers. It's an interesting one for Ireland, really, Mark, isn't it? Um, when you hear Morgan earlier this morning talking about almost a kind of a military or security kind of physical infrastructure security piece is, is quite a driver of research in, in the States. And that's not a history here, but it, it's probably something we do need to consider, isn't it? How research and data provision feeds into how we protect and make sure that our, our physical infrastructure on the renewable side is, is there to keep the lights on at all times, isn't it? It is absolutely, and and this is not just a defence uh, issue. This is a whole of society yeah. security issue, and and I think listening to other panelists there, we can see there is, this cascades down to everybody. So in the context of the 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 whole of society approach to defence and security, there is a mindset change required. I think in our jurisdiction to actually understand that piece, we we need uh, not just from the point of view of physical infrastructure, but we need to also reflect on the issue of the understanding that the protection of the ecosystem is actually the protection of ourselves. So this is a this is a, an existential threat if we don't get it right in the and we've seen that outside actually any you know malign force like another state, we see it in terms of the pushback in extreme events that are already being realized, uh, those 11 significant events uh, over, oh, sorry, those eight significant events over the last eleven days in four continents. It's 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 here. It's now. So what we need to understand is that in protecting the ecosystem, we are actually protecting ourselves and that broader piece. Then, in terms of the the uh, ability to move from actually damaging the ecosystem, which we do through uh, uncontrolled emissions, to uh, renewable sources. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going to jump to some of the questions here because you, you rightly point out it's an ex existential societal um, challenge that we're facing here. Um, and Izzy, you spoke to the obviously the, the real challenges and Morgan and the Minister spoke beforehand about if there are immediate challenges to you, you being able to survive and live today through affordability, then that kind of broader cha environmental challenge can be really stretching to, to overcome. And one of the questions that's come in uh, referenced what you had said, Cahill, on um, a fair and just transition in terms of energy is needed. Um, but there, were, there was a question there around the SEI retrofit program. It, is it demand led rather than targeting and prioritizing those most in need? Um, uh, I, I'll open it up for, for comment from others. I might just, uh, I suppose, cover it. Obviously, the, the retrofit program is a mix of, uh, you know, the local authorities, uh, social housing program, and also the warmer home scheme, which is fully funded retrofit. Um, and then there is obviously a whole mix of supports for uh, other homeowners to be able to upgrade their homes that it's a, a grant towards those. So there is a broad mix of, of offerings there as opposed to it just being the the one-stop shop to to homeowners as a grant scheme um targeting as well i don't i suppose uh want to as chair don't want to go into it, but uh, obviously there's a significant amount of looking at the data and who it's reaching um etc and, and who what homes are the lowest ber's for example that we would want to help pull up to the higher ber's Carl, I don't know whether you want to comment any further on that, Izzy, you may want to come in. Um, it really is looking, the, the comment is about EU cities have adopted a targeted approach which looks at public and social housing first in the retrofit and then targeting neighbourhoods with the aim of a blanket approach. So any further comments? Well, I think um, I'm probably not, not the person with the expertise in this area, but the um, we have to... The problem is, is the, the affordability of the fuel. As the affordability of the fuel goes out of whack with, you know, price volatility, that leaves people in a very bad place when it comes to trying to retrofit their homes or anything else. Uh, it, it eats up all available uh, income there. So I think uh, as well as people 
um, suffering from, you know, fuel poverty and uh, not not being able to heat their homes. There's also the fact that price volatility impacts on the ability of of householders to retrofit their homes. Thanks. I, I see a, a comment, and I don't know, Izzy, if you wanted to come in, um, that's come in afterwards saying, are universal benefits necessarily bad? Um, compared to the arguments for universal basic income, there are big advantage, advantages to universal services and benefits, uh, such as minimal costs of bureaucracy, no social stigma, universal, universal benefits are intrinsically redistributive. Um, any comments to that is, I suppose, a question uh, perhaps for you, Izzy and Justina. Are universal uh, benefits necessarily bad? Oh, Justina, do you want to come in first and then I can pitch in as well? Yeah, I don't Or mind. is that to the last question? Sorry. No, I don't no, know. I don't, I, I, on that one as well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want, yeah, okay. Well, I'll go. <laughs> Um, so I don't think they really. I think it's. I think it's the perceived unfairness of them. It, people, it, it's it's hard. Um, but when we just looked at, they say that the the recent electricity credit, it actually, well, it was very welcomed by everybody. So it, it was a very popular scheme. It was it was really really clean to administer because you know it was one MPRN and one household. So two point two million addresses and um, households could be reached with this. It was a flat amount of 200 euro. And so um, people in higher income bands probably have bigger homes to heat and um, bigger bills, whereas people on the lower income might have smaller homes. So it's proportionally worth more. So it's probably not as aggressive as it seems. And I know that some of the the economic um, analysis that was done and some of the, the analysis that was done on that to see, you know, was it how fair it was is coming back quite positive that it's 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 not as aggressive as it might look, you know, on the face of it, where you say everybody gets it no matter if you need it or, you know, if you're getting enough. So there's definitely advantages. Um, and in terms of trying to could say we won't give it to this people or we'll, we'll give more, that that there's a huge cost associated with that in trying to, to target it. But I think, we, I think, you know, from a human perspective, um, I think, it, it lands better where where you're you're really trying to focus on giving the most to those who need it most, and you're not giving additional to, to people who really don't need it. There's I think that there's a there's a real unfairness. There's a feel a strong feeling of unfairness there, and um, and I and I think that that's you know something that we should try and avoid if if we can. But yeah, I, I think it's better that we reach. I think it's better that people we make sure we reach everybody, and so we know that people who might have fallen out the net if we targeted it that needed it that at least they're getting it so yeah it, it is it's it's a difficult one but is he you might have something more yeah. thanks yeah um i'm not sure how kind of broad, broadly the question question was talking oh so obviously um there is definitely an argument and a strength in um having kind of supports that are there and you know we definitely need kind of services and income supports um that are there for everyone um, as I suppose kind of the safety net that is there for us um, and just to kind of think particularly about kind of energy and maybe the sort of energy supports over the last year or so um, we obviously had the the tranche or the rounds of um, the universal credits which um, obviously gave a huge amount of support to people and we certainly um, saw the impact of those supports at SVP on people um, I think Justina has just gone through, you know, the arguments and I suppose we would really, yeah, see that benefit of really, really using the resources we have targeted towards the people who we know. And we definitely now know after having been through this over the last year who really needs support. And so we have these resources that we have. Let's target them towards the people who we know Um kind of really really saw the impact of that those first rounds of electricity credits um but still were experiencing hardship and still struggled so now we're going into this winter let's kind of learn from that and kind of um really kind of weight weight our resources towards them i suppose define 
uh, yeah, a bit better. Okay, thanks, thanks, um, Izzy. I, I'm conscious I'm eating into people's coffee. I did want to go back with a quick one or two minutes to you, Mark, because you touched on it in your presentation, and again, uh, we were speaking a minute ago about. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation about wind energy as an export, and and um, but you've highlighted in conversations we've had, and again today that there is a huge opportunity for our home needs first, and that there is a lot there in terms of research and development and deployment to harness uh, our offshore energy for home needs. Can you just broaden on that uh, for quickly for a few minutes on where you think the best, I know you mentioned AMETS, for example, which is uh, kicking off, but where you think the real best advantages for research are, or opportunities for research are to realize uh, delivering energy security at home? Yeah, I, I think that a state-backed demonstration park that is uh, building the various elements that actually give you energy security is something we should look at. At the moment, I, I, I hear it's um, we're trying to get developers to look at um, green hydrogen uh, and the issue of e-fuels, whereas we have led internationally with the concept of the Atlantic Marine Energy Test Site. I know it's something that Mara has to get its arms around, and certainly I, I will be working with Laura Bryan on trying to expedite any consenting requirements that have to be expedited there. Similarly, with regards to Galway Bay, this Galway Bay is a quarter scale test site, Amets is a full scale test site. So now we have the actual uh, the thought process nationally and in government to actually stimulate renewable energy. But the next piece then is not just to stop with the electron production, uh, to look at what you do with those in terms of electrification of the grid, that's a given, but also perhaps the step beyond that with regards to production of green hydrogen and the actual uh, ability to produce e-fuels. That's something that is still a new technology, it's, it's new science. And I think the idea of the government putting its arms around that to actually bring from a renewable energy electron through, through, let's say, and research into the grid, into an energy park where you're doing the green hydrogen and also the carbon capture. Um, we need everything into the future. We need every molecule of carbon to be taken out of the air. So uh, my view is that when we've electrified, when we create created e-fuels, when we have our aircraft working on sustainable aviation fuel, we should also be using sustainable renewable energy then to actually do carbon capture and to take it out of the air, put it into the ground, turn it into stone as they're doing in, in, in Iceland. We, we, we are actually in a desperate position with regards to the amount of carbon that's in the air. So it's not good enough just to get to net zero on the, the, the basis of the current trend. We need to accelerate to net, net zero and beyond then in terms of the re removal of carbon out the air. So I, I'm harping on this a small bit, but the important piece is a, a, a holistic research focus on an innovation demonstrator that looks at renewable energy through a grid into energy park, production of in aviation or e-fuels and, and make that as something that is attractive internationally. Thanks, Mark. And I think it really points to the importance of localization. You can have a technology that's proven that works, but how does it work within the the, the jurisdiction that we live in and, and how do the how does the economy and the whole system react to that? So Look, I, I've eaten into people's uh, coffee break, and so I'm afraid that's all we'll have time for this morning, and I'll have to bring this conversation to a close. Uh, I'd really like to thank the panel, Cahill, Izzy, Justina, Mark, for their contributions and sharing your expertise and experience with us this morning. And thanks to everyone for the questions. Didn't get to all of them, um, but we tried to touch into to many of them. I hope you're enjoying the sessions thus far. Um, at this time, we're going to take a short break, uh, so hopefully get a chance to move around and get the blood flowing again and the kettle on um, for the next session. And we'd encourage you to check out the research posters and the poster gallery as well during the breaks today. So the research that you'll hear from today, there are posters available in there. It should be on your forum. You should be able to access it there. And we'll be kicking off again to the afternoon research, or the late morning research sprint at half 11. So looking forward to seeing you then and thank you.